today we're really pleased to welcome Heidi McKenzie um, to Nickel at Noon. Heidi and I have been talking about the potential of doing this talk for ages, so it's wonderful to finally be able to introduce her and, and share her really amazing work. Heidi McKenzie is a Toronto-based ceramic artist who graduated from Sheridan College in 2012 and subsequently completed her MFA in Curatorial Practice and Art Criticism from OCAD U in 2014. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Toronto Potters Biennial Award at the Gardner Museum in 2021. She's worked as an artist in residence nationally and internationally, most recently at Medalta in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Her work is included in private and public collections, including the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canada and the Surrey Art Gallery in British Columbia. For her talk today, Heidi will uh, provide an overview of her ongoing practice of using ceramic sculpture as a canvas for photographic images and explorations of race, identity, ancestry, migration and archive, excuse me, as well as body and healing. And she'll discuss her very exciting upcoming solo exhibition at the Esplanade Gallery in Medicine Hat called Brick by Brick Absence versus Presence opening uh, April the 25th, so really soon, uh, and running until the middle of July. Her installations will draw on over a century of archival photographs of the brickyards of Medicine Hat, the Ross Creek flood of 2010, and IXL's untimely demise, and you'll have to tell us what IXL is, I don't know. Um, her work is intriguing and beautiful, and it's just wonderful to have you here. Heidi, um, again, this has been a long time in, a long time coming. All right, um, you know, before I forget, I'm just going to say, sorry, I didn't mention this to you, uh, Michelle, but the um, uh, Esplanade has extended the run of the show until August 20th, so you have more chance to see it. <laughs> um, so I want to start by thanking the Nickel Gallery and Michelle Hardy. Uh, in particular for inviting me to be present this afternoon. And I would like to take this time to thank and acknowledge uh, the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Council for various parts of the creation and development of some of the work that you're going to be seeing this afternoon. So uh, as Michelle mentioned, I, I, uh, I see my career as an evolution and um, I want to take you through this journey at a fairly quick pace so that I can spend some time walking you through the process, thinking, technology behind the show that I'm about to install. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow for Medicine Hat. Um, that will be at the Esplanade. And, um, and as, as Michelle mentioned, it's brick by brick, absence versus present. Okay. So I began my practice uh, making sort of abstract self-portraits and throwing and altering mixed clays. And um, in, in 2017, um, I, I went to, um, sorry, I went to Australia and I started coil building and I was looking at reinvigorating modernism kind of in accessible ways for diverse communities. And um, in 2013, um, between my first and second year of my MFA at OCAD U, um, I created my own studio component to my degree. And I spent a month in um, Jingdezhen, China. And I spent two months in uh, Bali, Indonesia at the Gaia Center for Ceramics. And these, as you can see, are Euclidean forms. And they have always represented for me uh, a sense of body uh, in an abstract way. And these particular pieces I've used, I, I started here with the talk around image and archive on clay and ceramics because this was really the first time I put image on clay and these are Chinese transfers. Um, and for me, these are an expression of um, kind of the tension between the um, tradition, the traditional Chinese uh, culture and um, kind of the innovative drive that I really experienced in, in the students uh, in Jindajang. And so I call these, these pieces China Bound. So after I went, after I finished my MFA in, in the following fall, I uh, trekked off to Gulagahad 
actually, okay, I'm saying that phonetically. It's Denmark. And um, this was really the first time that I, I put, tried my hands at making my own plaster molds uh, because they were made for me in Jin de Zhang. Um, I learned to make multi-part molds and I began thinking about putting clay on image uh, while I was in Denmark. So you can see uh, the evolution from the China Bound series here, still using an Euclidean form. Uh, sorry, it's not a Euclidean form, it's a tetrahedron, uh, irregular tetrahedron. So I represent body um, and still altering clay and, and kind of using the sort of bands of clay to kind of look like, um, uh, look almost like the, the soul or the essence of the human being. Oops, okay, there we are. Um, so I, at first I worked in monochrome and I was literally gluing laser decals uh, body parts onto the corners of the form. Um, and immediately after the residency, I myself had some health issues and that prevented me from working in the studio for about a year and a half. So, hang on, I'm just gonna pull my notes up. Um, but what pulled me back to the studio was the fact that my father was nearing the end of his life and I felt compelled to document his life. And I, I didn't know at the time that his death was imminent uh, but he was 85 and he had survived seven terminal illnesses over three decades. And, you know, the last diagnosis was pretty bleak. So in January of 2016, I approached my father with a, a project in mind and he was all in and gung ho. Um, my father stripped down to his Mickey Mouse boxing shorts and I photographed his emaciated body from head to toe. And I realized that what I wanted to say was, this is my father. He survived so much see him and um, really I wanted to show the complexity of the life of an immigrant from Trinidad who came in the 1950s before Canada reversed its whites only immigration policies and married a white American woman in 1957 at a time when 98% of Americans were against mixed marriages and it was still illegal in many US states. So this was really my first engagement with archival photographs on ceramics. And one side of the mobile has a close-up of his body, his scars, his survival. And the other side carries photographs of his life in Trinidad and his early life in Canada up until about 1960. And I called them memory photos. I wasn't really at that time aware that I was working with archive. Um, my father passed on June 3rd, 2016, the day the installation well, was taken down. And this is the last portrait of my father who requested to be documented with the son on his back that I took. And we'll come back to this, um, but in the context of talking about archival imagery. This is the youngest known photograph of my father uh, at about 10, probably in 1940. And it was gifted to me after the passing of his sister, sorry, after his passing by his sister, I'm sorry. So I did a small exhibition uh, in the lobby of the shop at the Gardner Museum. And um, it was called Family Matters in 2019. And I wasn't able to put up Body Interrupted, the mobile, um, because of technical constraints, but I knew I had to tell my father's story. And this kind of uh, conceptually came to me in a flash. And uh, these are um, porcelain ceramic substrate and iron oxide decal on cards and I made a house of cards that mirrors the precarity of both his health and his life and his struggle to build a new life in Canada. Um, okay, so the, I think you can sort of see that those are his ancestors and his immediate family and his early life and then his life with my mother. Um, a key photograph, the one that was on the, on the table there, is of my great-great-grandmother, Runia. Um, Runia is, uh, well, Runia, Runia came from Calcutta to um, Guyana in 1864, 1864 sorry. Um, and it's a very important photograph, and uh, it really, really launched me on my my discovery of family archive. 
here's here, here's the treatment of um, the two um, photos that I, I just showed you done in the cards with the iron oxide decal decals. So the year before I had begun to kind of strongly make the connection between the sepia tones on fired laser decals and the sepia tones of naturally weathered archival photographs, I decided to build this small piece um, with my own archival family photographs from both sides of my family. And I am using you know, the building block as a metaphor that we are all the sum of who we came from. And I set myself up a little rule that uh, every photograph had to have um, equal number of images from my mother's side of the family and my father's, and every photograph had to be taken before I was born. It's full iteration is, uh, you know, I was a deep dive into both sides of my family. Um, and I have photographs from uh, 18, well, from the late 19th century from both sides of my parents. And um, I'm just gonna bookmark talking about indentureship at this point and come back to it. That I'm, I'm just talking about this piece going up the Canadian plain glass this fall. Okay. Um, so representing body through abstraction is really what got me started um, working with image on ceramics. Um, and I mentioned that I had a bit of a health crisis in 2015, 2016. And as I was making the body interrupted mobile of my father, I realized I needed to make this self-portrait about the experience of living in my body. Um, in 2020, I self-curated an exhibition uh, in a room at the Gladstone Hotel in Toronto as part of their come up to my room and it was called Body Within. And it was, this was part of the, of the work that I made. Uh, again, image on, um, ceramic substrate and these, you know, I went around and collected all my x-rays, my scans, all the digital, uh, everything that was digitally available, which happened to be um, a 10 year span of tests. And um, put these on this work, again, a sort of house of cards. And in that exhibition, this is my first foray into uh, video multimedia on ceramics. Is that playing? Yes, it is. Um, I created these pieces in Ketchkament in Hungary in 2018, and um, it's a wall hanging piece. Uh, it's about um, the size of a 60 inch television screen. And um, when I'm projecting here uh, videos that were, have been digitized that were eight millimeter home movies that my father would have taken of me uh, as an infant um, that you know, I didn't discover until much later in, in my life existed. Um, and, and kind of the idea here is that we're, many of us are fortunate to, enough to be born with uh, bodies intact, but we don't always know what's kind of lurking below in our DNA. And in, in my case, I, ha I had a, a pretty debilitating kidney disease, a congenital kidney disease. Okay. Uh, All right, so I'm jumping around a little bit, but there is a flow here. Um, in 2017, uh, I decided to take the form that I had worked with in Denmark, the cube with the sides cut off, um, and explore my place in Canada. And uh, actually it was for the 150th anniversary of Confederation. And, um, Uh, I grew up in Fredericton, New Brunswick, um, in the 70s and the 80s, and it was predominantly white uh, settler society. And I chose to um, put archival photographs of me doing Canadian things in the corners. So, you know, ballet dancing and Scottish country dancing and visiting Anne of Green Gables and skiing and skating, all these things. Um, but on the larger facets, I chose to use iconic Canadian imagery. And I, I went to the Canadian Postal Service archive 
uh, to look through uh, for images for those. So you'll see, you know, Wayne Gretzky, the queen, beavers, moose, um, loons, all kinds of things. So it's a 26 piece installation. So doing this work led me down kind of a rabbit warren of research and reading about indentureship. And so I guess I have here a note to explain about indentureship because I believe it is a little known history um, and it's, it's, it's where I'm going next and wh where I've been working actually for the last, last couple of years in, little, in, in smaller uh, bits and pieces. Um, so my short explanation of what is indentureship is um, basically Britain abolished slavery uh, the African slave trade um, in its colonies in 1833. And that meant that they were missing a huge labor force to uh, tend their cash crops, like largely the sugar plantations, but also coffee, cocoa, uh, pineapple, and so on. Um, and they tried a bunch of different groups of people, um, Portuguese, Scottish, Chinese, but they settled on, on the Indians and um, a million Indians between 1838 and 1917 uh, were shipped out to work in the, in the colonies and half a million of those went to the Caribbean. Um, so my father's ancestors were one of those come from, from that background. So, um, and these pieces that I'm showing you right now are illuminated lives of uh, the Cooley woman who, um, and you, you'll, you'll, I think you can sort of see in the panes uh, of porcelain that are, are literally illuminated that, that they're largely look very uh, exotic and extravagant and dressed up, but that was staged by Westerners and, and Western photographers so that, that, you know, they could have postcards so that Western travelers could send back to their friends saying, look how well we're treating our, our Hindus. Um, so this next piece, Oh yeah, see, these are some of the postcards, sorry. And uh, that those images are come from. And this next piece is, um, uh, speaks to division of class and race and status between indentured workers and plantation owners. So um, it's a contemporary version of a Victorian room divider. And it, it could well have been in, in the home of a, a Victorian aged uh, plantation owner. And you'll see, you know, a, a, a Victorian screen in this sort of rather ex, 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 opulent setting. And each, each pane has um, an image, an archival image of kind of the livelihood and, and, and the lives of the indentured workers. So bringing them into the, um, into the homes of the masters is the idea here. Oops. Okay. So, um, just gonna right. All right, hang on. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, all right. Okay, so here I am. Uh, and this is a ship, this is the Fatal Rosac, and um, I presented at the World Indian Di Diaspora Congress um, in May 2020, and this is the first ship that brought Trinidadians, uh, nearly 300 indentured workers, to, uh, from, from India to Trinidad. And um, on the occasion of the 175th anniversary of that event, Trinidad made public for the very first time the archives um, of uh, the manifest of the ship. And when I saw that, uh, those archives, I knew I had to, to make an art, art piece. And this is, this is a replica of the ship. Um, <clears throat> and this is, I, I, I later started doing research with uh, some distant cousins in the UK um, and discovered that my father's maternal ancestors are actually on the ship's manifest. So it was really exciting for me. And I used, um, in, to, to represent the portals, I used uh, coins from 1843, uh, both British and Indian coins. So, um, 
gee, I'm trying to, I don't remember when the invitation came, but for last spring, uh, I was invited to participate in the Biennale, Biennale Internationale du Lin de Port Neuf, uh, which is in a, a small um, set of villages between Trois-Rivières and Quebec City. And there were 22 international artists responding to the theme of revirement, which is turnarounds um, and incorporating conceptually um, or physically linen. So aside from the building box project, I hadn't really started working deeply with my mother's archive or with her roots or with my sense of my mother. And I had a feeling that if I dug deep enough, I was gonna find a connection between, uh, between, between my mother's roots and linen. And as it happened, um, uh, I did. <laughs> um, my mother's family came from uh, northern north of Belfast, and they were um, farmers. And they they came during the potato famine. In about the same time, uh, my ancestors came from India to to the west to the Caribbean. They came from Ireland uh, to Canada, and. Um, I guess what's exciting for me is that I can imagine that they might have farmed the flax that fueled the linen industry in Belfast. And, Bel and Belfast was really a well known um, for linen. And they were one of the first to adopt this jacquard loom punch card system of creating complex patterns and really highly industrialize it. So here you can see um, some of the tiles that I made. I made about 80 tiles, I hand punched them. They're, uh, porcelain. And then I uh, took the, uh, I was inspired by some of the museum photography that I had, and I built this loom, and I called it Linen Linenopolis. Um, okay, so now I'm at part two, uh, where I'm going to talk to you about the upcoming show. Um, so, in February, January, February of 2019, I was an artist in residence at the Shaw International Center for Contemporary Ceramics at Medalta in the historic clay district in Medicine Hat. And it was the coldest winter on record. <laughs> I remember the first week, um, I, Al Dillman, who was the former foreman of IXL Bricks. Uh, so Michelle, IXL Brick, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't stand for anything, it, it actually, uh, Malcolm Sissons, who is a direct descendant of the founder of IXL, literally IXL, I, that's what it comes from. And uh, it has become a you know, huge, um, um, I guess, conglomerate um, and a supplier of brick, brick and brick uh, products. So, uh, Al gave us a, a, a four hour tour of, of the dormant factory and um, it's the oldest manufacturing site in Alberta. Um, in fact, brick production began um, under a different name in, in 1896 until, and, it, and continued until the June of 2010 when the Ross Creek flooded over the burn barriers and destroyed the recently roboticized plant sort of beyond repair. But, um, I was immediately in awe of the sense of what, what it might have been like for the average worker there. And I found myself thinking about my father's experience um, working in, in manual labor. And he worked the, uh, as a brick mason for the furnaces in Stelco Hamilton when he was studying uh, at McMaster in the 1950s. And uh, he used to tell us um, that uh, he, he, the reason he had to work the brick furnaces was because the prevailing thought at the time was the darker your skin, um, the more heat you could withstand. So um, that's really, that, that, that story and that comment was, was really kind of the kernel of, of what inspired me for, for this show. Um, and these, these bricks are, um, some architectural bricks that I just found lying around in the factory. And they really inspired me because they, um, I was working at Badalta at the time on my spaces within series and kind of building big. And I think you can see the, the resonance between the bricks and, and the sculptures. 
And I immediately knew that uh, I needed to, to sculpt these bricks. And, and I, I wanted to put the images of, of the workers onto the bricks and, and, I, and I wanted to bring them to life. And so before I left uh, Medicine Hat, I um, contacted and pitched the then curator at the Esplanade, Joanne Marion, um, this idea. And uh, within a couple of months, I had uh, a little seed grant from the Toronto Arts Council to kind of begin exploring and, and experimenting um, with that idea. So by the fall of 2020, I was doing test tiles, <laughs> lots and lots of test tiles to figure out which slip and are the images gonna work? Are they gonna pick up on augmented reality? How's that gonna happen? Um, I connected with um, James Kuhn at the uh, Medicine Hat College, the Co College of Medicine Hat, uh, who's working in augmented reality. And, and he, he sort of helped me figure out whether this is gonna be possible. Um, sorry. Um, right, and then I started working uh, with um, the archive the actual Esplanade archive um, and looking at the images of the workers and the brick building. Um, and I interviewed people and I talked to people and um, you know, I, I read everything I could read and did a lot of research. Um, Malcolm Sissons, I mentioned is the former um, recently retired CEO of IXL Bricks and was enormously helpful and supportive um, and had an has an encyclopedic memory for historic events. Um, and I worked with uh, Susan McKinnon, uh, who at the time was with Collections and Archive at Medalta. Um, so, and, you know, pulled up information and demographics um, from the city. Um, and actually it was um, Jennifer Utrera Barrientos from the Esplanade Archive that, that, that helped me um, you know, the, really probably the most <laughs> pulling together the archival information that I needed to, to make the show happen. So I'm just gonna show you now, um, I think I have five of the bricks of images, of five of the six bricks, but there are images on both sides of the bricks and um, they're, they're tabletop size. They're, they're about, you know, some of them are that wide, some this tall or that tall. And uh, all of them I used um, the, this, this technique of the iron oxide sepia tone. Bricks. And uh, James put me in touch with um, Kira Vietstra. And uh, she, was, she was a student of, um, a student of his who had recently graduated. And uh, it's, it's Kira that, that really uh, did the, the heavy lifting on the building of the augmented reality. And, and we worked together. Um, and I'm just gonna show you, I think I have uh, three short videos. So if you point your camera, your smartphone or an iPad at the brick in the gallery, this is what you should be seeing popping on your screen. And this is actually one of the longer ones, and that is the per mile site from 1897. Sorry. So you can see, um, you know, the cutout figures and then questioning absence and presence and belonging. And it's really great <laughs> uh, animated work, Kira's work. Uh, here's another shorter one that's on the flip side of this brick, which I think is really poignant and central to the, the themes that I'm exploring. A 
Okay, so moving on. And this is uh, the last augmented reality brick I'm going to share to today. It's more recent, I think, from the 1970s. They're building a tunnel brick here. I think Kira really outdid herself artistically, playing with the image here. So um, I had six bricks and that didn't crack or that didn't break. <laughs> and um, Xanthi uh, Ipsters, the current director and curator of the galleries and collections at the Esplanade Arts and Heritage Center um, was fantastic. She embraced the project and um, has been an invaluable guide um, and mentor. Uh, and she offered me um, a solo exhibition for approximately a thousand square foot. Uh, gallery, and that's where I will be installing next week the show. And um, but six bricks is not enough for a, a thousand foot square gallery, and she encouraged me to dream big. Um, I chose um, one of the images that I had shot of the melted kiln cars when I was there during during the tour to animate. And luckily, Kira was still in Medicine Hat and was able to go to. Uh, the um, site and, and reshoot it for me at a higher resolution because we are going to produce it large. Um, we're not sure how large, uh, but it's gonna be somewhere between five to eight square feet. And um, here is the video uh, that Kira developed that you'll, you'll be able to see large in, at the end of the gallery, sort of recreating the experience of what happened to the outside of the factory. So literally the train pin is moving all the time and um, a number of pins, a number of bricks, innumerable bricks were destroyed either raw or in, in the firing process. Okay, so from the very beginning of the, the uh, knowing that I had a gallery to fill, I, I, I had in my mind that I wanted to put my images on the walls, um, some of the images uh, that I had taken of, of the factory. Um, and I guess Xanthi had thought I was, you know, in my proposal, she had thought I was going to put archival images up on the wall. And then I guess sometime in December, I realized that, you know, the most powerful thing would be to hold the tension between the past and the present and um, kind of curate diptychs of images. So there are going to be uh, seven sets of images um, and they're gonna be printed 30 inch by 56 inch. Well, they are already printed and they're there waiting to be installed. So these are just some of the those prints. And that's, you can see it's the same gas pump they, that Jim Marshall, um, who has worked at IXL for many years uh, and was is an amazing brick sculptor. Um, he was part of the uh, restoration of, of that gas pump that stands there now. But, um, I still did not have um, my large installation sorted out. And, you know, at one point I was thinking of building a, a brick, a, a wall of raw bricks and, and kind of, um, you know, bringing in this notion of the flood and water and melting, you know, dissolving the bricks. And, and um, you know, I did a, a number of tests about it and I, you know, it wasn't really working. It wasn't working conceptually, it wasn't working. Um, technically and physically, I was, you know, and I, I really was tormented and, and, and struggled uh, with what, what am I going to do? <laughs> what else am I going to do for this gallery? And again, it was Anthe who, who really encouraged me to kind of think about, well, what is it that I'm really trying to say? And when I got down to the core of it, I realized that um, what I really wanted to, to do was to stress the permanence and impermanence of factory 
of the workers and the livelihood of the factory. And that was absence and presence and that that would be best done with the permanence of real bricks. So I started talking to uh, Al Dillman, um, the former uh, foreman who's looking after the, um, the dormant brick factory. And um, before I knew it, I was, um, just come back to that slide. I was, I was, I had a, a loan agreement from the Delta to have two hacks. So about 1100 bricks um, borrowed so that I could sculpt them um, in the gallery. And so they are there waiting. And these are my little maquette bricks in a 12 to one size scale. And that I, I started figuring out what, what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was um, a wave of bricks. And again, this, the imagery and symbolism and ideas behind the water and the movement and, and, and the, the permanence and, and of, of, of ceramic bricks and impermanence of the factory. So I realized that I needed to have, you know, these things made to make the little ripple and um, it has yet to be built. So I have come to almost the end of my presentation. Um, what I would like to do um, is talk you through um, uh, a video that is going to be projected onto the brick sculpture from above. So I'm going to just stop sharing for a moment and share my screen again and pull up the video. It's going to be in a six minute loop. I will pick my uh, friend. That's my friend named David Atkin on this, this video. And that's one of the ISL bricks. In fact, um, when I decided what I wanted to do, I reached back out, out to Martin Sissons, who uh, amazingly managed to get me some digital tips in 1980 at the website time. That's some of that footage you see right now. Um, and also some bit uh, footage of the um, wrote roboticized machine making the actual bits that I will actually be using to sculpt the wave. And so I did spend a lot of time, you know, um, well, I, I, I actually I had a brick mason spend time on my behalf, trying to find flat bricks without holes that are the same color and the same dimension. And they just literally don't exist. Um, but then I decided to make them made out of lemons and, and emphasize the holes in the bricks that the video is going to be projected onto. So, that's, that's what we're doing here. And you can just imagine the soundscape and the water and, and so on. I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes uh, to see a little bit more of the film. And then um, I hope you have some questions for me because I'd really love to uh, discuss the project with you. What we had is a real training town. It was uh, David's idea to incorporate imagery of the workers in the collage, video collage. And of course, the women stepped up to work in the plant during the other day, too. I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. I think this part is really neat, and then we'll close it up. So this is the roboticized machine. And then thinking about machines that are duplicating and creating and manufacturing. There's this duplicating process that happens in the video. A bit like a kaleidoscope. And, uh, and then the end. 
I guess if you really want to see the whole thing, you have to get to Medicine Hat. I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Hand it back over to Michelle, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heidi. Wow, that was amazing.